Okay, now everyone's going to hear us. So, as I said, welcome, welcome to the Machine Talk, Talk Speech and Human Interaction, interaction speaker series starring Ms. Argum. Um, I, I am Jim White, and I'm an operations coordinator with your GI, and I'd like to take a moment to talk about the Institute, give you context, the land um, that, that, that we're going on. So, for those who are not, not familiar, the GI um, is a research, research institute at the University of Waterloo that is home to interdisciplinary researchers who seek to advance the study, design, and purpose of interactive and immersive technologies and experiences. Our research, of course, um, includes games, but also includes interactive and immersive media at large. Um, we endeavor to be a place where researchers from all backgrounds can come and work together and learn from each other um, beyond the boundaries of um, the dis disciplines. So now I will do the ter territorial acknowledgement. So it's important for us at the Games Institute to recognize the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the indigenous peoples with whom we share the land that we live with and work on today. Um, we are working to continually make space for indigenous scholars, designers, commentators, um, and creators to uplift all voices that are marginalized in both academic and gaming communities. We acknowledge that the land um, and on which we work and live today is the traditional land of the Adawan, Don, Ron, Anishabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, the University of Waterloo, where we work, is situated on the Haudenosaunee track, um, which includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about the GI and our commitment to anti-racism, decolonization, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, please check out the pages on the GI website, which we will link in the chat. But yeah, um, so just to get started. So in this talk, PhD candidate Nima Zorgan will give a um, broad perspective on approaches when designing desirable human speech interaction and discuss relevant design factors. He's a visit visiting PhD student working with the Digital Media Lab at the University of Brenham and his research focuses on human speech interaction. So you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Montana, for the very nice introduction. Then let's start. So a little bit about me. I'm a fourth year PhD student uh, with a background in IT. I uh, had my bachelor's in Hungary uh, in information technology. Then I did my master's in digital media in Bremen, Germany. And I have a bit of uh, industry background uh, as an UI UX designer, web developer, app developer, and uh, 2D animator. So a lot of uh, visual design background and some programming, so to say. And uh, I'm from the Digital Media Lab, uh, which is basically a lab directed by Raina Malaka. Uh, so we have more than 25 researchers, which mainly focus on uh, natural user interfaces for AR, VR, uh, tangible user interfaces, usability, uh, usable security and privacy, game user research, explainable AI, dark patterns, etc. cetera. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about speech interaction. Um, so speaking is one of the earliest forms of human communication and it's a fundamental mode of conveying thoughts, ideas, and emotions since ancient times. Um, so voice emerges as an interest, uh, interesting aspect of, of uh, social interaction with humans. And it extends to interactions with other species, for example, with animals, right? So um, it comes kind of natural that we also want to talk to other things. Uh, due to technological advancements, now we are able to talk to objects. Um, why do we do it? Intuition. Uh, speaking is, of course, a natural way of communication uh, among humans, and we find it easier to interact with technology that resemble our own characteristics. Uh, so now, nowadays, there are systems which allow you to talk to them and interact with them via voice or so speech, and these systems are called voice user interfaces. Uh, usually, voice user interfaces uses some kind of uh, use some kind of an AI agent, and these AI agents basically can perceive the environment, process information, take actions autonomously, and achieve certain goals. Some of the examples of these AI agents that can interact with your voice are Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, etc. Right? You should have all probably experienced with uh, uh, these agents somehow. Maybe not often, but 
I'm 100% sure you've heard of them. Uh, so voices interfaces are now used for several purposes. You can use them for, for navigation, for scheduling in smart home environments, for educational purposes, and for entertainment, such as music and, and video games. You can see them in a variety of devices, personal computers, cars, mobile phones, and home assistants. Um, so they are growing a lot, uh, and it's being more and more used by people. However, uh, the experience with these devices is frequently uh, reported as unsatisfactory, disappointing, or embarrassing. So who knows why is that the reason? So why do people have unsatisfactory experiences with these systems? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Right. So the, the fact that you know you're talking to an object and it's not a human interaction, so you don't feel the warmth of a human interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so th that that's actually one of the reasons. There there are many many reasons, and one of the most common reasons for this form of interaction that uh, basically makes it a bit unpleasant is that it's technically still weak, so it's not working so well yet. Um, so the recognition failures happen quite often, still even though the technology has advanced very well, especially in the past couple of years, we still experience way too many uh, technical issues. And the other reason is that they are usually limited. So they have a limited functionality. They understand certain type of interactions. They don't know many others, right? Um, and one other thing as, as we kind of touched upon is that humans are very good in talking and in communication. So they have a very high expectations in their basically partner that they are conversing with. So we are very picky if something doesn't function well in our communication. Um, so all in all, these factors basically uh, somehow make such systems to work uh, or appear a bit unintelligent or immature, so to say. But in defense of such uh, the speech systems, it's super difficult to design a system like that. So you basically need to process a, a, a large set of data and have a very big repository of collected uh, voice data. You need to have uh, different inflections and variations. Uh, if you want to basically be more accessible, you need to have different languages, different dialects, different accents. It's super time consuming and the, the technology behind it is also super complicated. And of course, as humans, we phrase things very differently. So if you want to say something or achieve a goal, we do it in very different ways. So a uh, different form of phrasing is also uh, a, a factor here. Um, so to simplify the process of human agent speech interaction, we basically have an input and then we receive an output from the system, right? This is the most simplified uh, version of the process. However, let's break it down a bit to see what happens actually in the background. So you, the user gives a uh, speech command, then this command is decoded. So from the human language to a machine understandable uh, format, then natural language understanding in you is, is used to basically see how to process this, this uh, intent that is given. Then the dialogue management is basically something that decides what is the proper response to that intent. And then output generator basically generates this or uh, turns this into from machine readable response to a human readable response. And in the end, we turn that text into speech. So uh, using an output render. So it's, it's a very long process. And this is still also a very simplified uh, version of what actually happens in the background. Um, but I don't want to get too much into the details of, of the technical side of it. Um, however, Again, let's go back to the simplified version uh, that, that we discussed earlier. User gives an input, something happens in the background, a processing happens, then the system generates an output, right? 
what the user sees is of course the front end matter of the things so how what kind of input they give and what do they hear back um, all the other technical aspects happen in the back end of the system so my dissertation focuses basically on two sides of the this process basically on processing aspect and what kind of output system generates um, the goal of my, my uh, PhD work is on designing uh, speech systems that are more desirable for, for users and empower them uh, to engage more with, with, uh, uh, with, with the voice systems. And I focus mainly on domestic settings. So this is of course uh, a, a choice that you have to make on where, where do you want to lay your focus on. There, there are uh, many different variety of devices that work with voice systems uh, or basically have voice features uh, and different settings. You can have uh, voice uh, interaction or speech interaction for banking, for instance. Uh, but I focus on domestic uh, setting because uh, it basically uh, I'll, I'll gives a, so it's a very particular setting. First of all, it, technology usually grows in homes and uh, these devices are very widespread in homes at the moment. And uh, at home is, is the particular setting that it, you have usually maximum comfort, you have privacy. Uh, it's a safe social space, so to say. And you can have different social dynamics. It's either a single user or multi-user settings. Uh, and you have a task variety. So the variety of the things you can do with these systems and homes is, is uh, basically more broad. Um, and of course, you can connect them with, with other systems as well. Uh, another focus basically that I have is speech-based games or speech interaction in video games. Um, so why did I choose a speech in games? Because games allow us to have a controlled environment. It has high degrees of uh, immersion. It's entertaining, kind of have low costs in comparison to certain other settings and it's easy to replicate and you would also avoid certain privacy concerns um, so for designing voices interfaces usually you have functional goals and experiential goals so functional goals are those that would basically uh, refer to something that makes it actually function so how the system works uh, speech recognition functional goal we would like the system to be solid it has to recognize everything it has to understand everything i say if not it has to be able to handle how something was not recognized and give me the best outcome afterwards or it has to be able to do a wide variety of tasks so it should be uh, supporting a lot of uh, different tasks that users need um, now i'm gonna uh, talk about one of our research works which is uh, with regards to error handling um, so I've done research on speech recognition and error hand handling uh, aspect of the functional goal, so to say. But since the one in speech recognition has not been published yet, I'm going to talk about the one that was published. So let's go talk about error handling. Um, so error handling happens in the processing side or in the back end, so to say. And uh, what is error handling? When do we uh, need error handling? So when system does not understand something or when the system misunderstand something or you say something that system is not capable to respond they have to come up with a fallback strategy so they have to respond to you somehow and usually what the system does is either ask you to repeat your command please try again or redirect you to a number of tasks that they can actually do did you mean this or do you want to look at what we can do or uh, basically present uh, uh, with uh, just come up with a with a humorous response so this happens quite often for example with with alexa or with siri they don't understand what you say they just come up with a random joke sometimes helps uh, often makes user even more frustrated um, so studies have shown that when recognition errors happen that the probability of it happening afterwards is even more. Do you know why that happens? So once 
an error recognition, one, once an error happens, once the system doesn't understand you, the probability of you making this or have experiencing the same afterwards is going, is going to be higher. So the system might not understand you again. Why do you think that is? Well, learning camp should make it easier for you to, to actually make it work, right? So. The user, the user may simply sort of repeat the request as opposed to Sure, yeah, yeah. So they, they basically, that's where learning curve doesn't exist, right? But uh, the main reason that the researchers argued for this was that people get frustrated and they just get angry. And then it impacts their, their language and it impacts how they phrase things. So it just keeps happening more and more. Um, so what we did in our study is basically we designed a game called Listen Sparky. And in this game, characters could control, uh, players could control the main character with the uh, voice interaction or speech commands. You basically impersonate a shepherd in this game, which gives directions to sheepdog, to a sheepdog. And the idea is you have to guide this sheepdog to get out of this, this zone in the, that you see in the map. So navigate it through the, uh, to escape the meadow. And there's a wolf which would eat the sheep if the sheep gets too close to the wolf. Um, so there were a few possibilities for players to navigate the, the dog or command the dog to navigate the ship. Uh, and we basically looked into, uh, I don't know if it's possible, but they will try. Left side. Okay. Walk towards. Right side. Okay. Anyway, left side. I think this is making it more complicated. Please copy the page by YouTube link in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll send the link afterwards in the chat. Um, thank you. All right. So what we had in this game, basically, we had two. Uh, two conditions. In, in the control group, it used the traditional repeating uh, form of, of error handling. So once something is not understood, the computer asks you to repeat yourself. So you see a question mark, and then you know, okay, they didn't, the system does, didn't understand you, so you have to repeat again. In the other condition, we picked the best possible option for the player. So we basically uh, looked into what is the best outcome in the game for the player to progress further in the game. So how we did that was we would calculate where the character is, where the wolf is, where is the gate, and we would simulate the actions and see which action would lead to a better outcome or best outcome possible for the user. Does it collide with the wolf? If yes, we wouldn't perform that action. Does it get closer to the gate? If yes, would be one of the options, right? So they would basically, the system would perform all these uh, actions and then choose the best possible outcome for the user. Sometimes there wouldn't be uh, the best possible outcome. All of them, all, all the actions would lead to the, the ship getting eaten by the wolf. Um, so our research questions were on uh, about uh, uh, the usability of the speech system as well as the game experience. Um, so we compared these two um, in, in a between subject design study with 34 participants and players had to play eight levels of the game I just showed you and fill out the post exposure questionnaires and then we did a uh, short interview with each participant afterwards. Um, so our results showed that overall people really liked speaking to the game. So they liked the fact that it's a speech based game, they can talk to the characters. Uh, they felt more immersed, they felt like they're an actual shepherd, they're controlling, uh, controlling a dog. Um, and uh, 
one, one of the most common feedback was the struggles with recognition, no surprise. Uh, so people felt that people had several uh, basically experiences in each gameplay session with uh, recognition of the of their voice commands. And we, we noticed that the performance of the players improved uh, over time. So in the beginning, in the first levels, they didn't know the system well, they didn't know how to phrase their uh, intents, but then they learned how to interact with the system. They learned how to phrase things, what works best for them, and, and then the recognition uh, rates decreased. Uh, we also noticed that on, in times that they were under time pressure, it led to more complications. So if the, the uh, uh, wolf was getting closer to the ship, they would get nervous. It would impact how they phrase things. They would say things faster or they would say things with a higher pitch. That would impact the uh, recognition accuracy. Um, in general, we found that the, the usability of the system was uh, enhanced in, in our proposed method. Um, so when the system chose the best option for the uh, for people, they perceived it as higher uh, as having a higher usability. Um, even though there were more errors in the second condition or in the intervention group, people perceived less errors in in that group as the errors were kind of hidden, right? Because the game would perform something for them as as the best outcome. Nevertheless people still noticed certain type of errors. Uh, what, what were these, these errors in cases of mis mismatches when people would say something and the game would perform something else. So basically the initial intent was go forward, but then the game would go left because that would be the best outcome. Uh, people saw that as a different type of error, even if the game would help them somehow. Um, so this also led into a misleading learning experience in the, in the intervention group so people did not know why this this behavior was happening right um, and if it deviated from what they initially intended to do uh, of course this was unpleasant for them but and overall we had very diverse opinions some thought it helped to keep the flow of the game uh, some thought that it's hiding the problem rather than solving it others thought that they should perform random actions to make the game more challenging you know it would be more fun. Um, overall, the takeaways for us was that it's still rather subjective what the, the players would prefer in this sense. Um, that they, they, they want to have the option to choose if they want to use this kind of error handling or different kinds. So let's make it customizable, so to say. And the on the other hand, um, if if the error handling did not match their initial intent even though it would do something for the uh, for the sake of the player to progress further they would not like it so agency is much more important um, and the effort should be more put on the initial intended action of the user so try to uh, predict what the user actually wanted to do um, and this can be imagined for other voice user interfaces for other voice systems, uh, which are task oriented, which you could predict the outcome, so to say, and uh, leave it for the for the users to choose. Do you want us to decide for you if we know the best outcome, or do you want to uh, basically be in charge of, of uh, how it goes? Um, going back to the design goals. I, I talked a bit about the functional goals, and uh, now I want to talk about the experiential goals. Um, to, for us to understand what people want to experience with these systems and what kind of uh, features do they want uh, or expect from these systems, we uh, conduct uh, an elicitation study, which basically we ask participants, what are your customization or personalization uh, features that you demand from this system that you would prefer uh, the system provide for you. We also ask them what kind of personality do you want a voice agent to have? Um, so in this study, we use an approach inspired by scenario based design method where we uh, presented a series of hypothetical situations uh, for, for participants and then asked them to reflect on the situations. 
Um, so this helps participants to contemplate better and have a widened uh, perspective on what are the possibilities, what could be the features, etc. We didn't want to limit them into these scenarios. Of course, they could go beyond them, but we wanted to have something to start things off. Um, then we designed 10 of these storyboards. There's a long process on how we designed these storyboards, um, which, which I don't have enough time to go into the details of that, but you can definitely refer to the paper for the details, and uh, I can also explain it after this talk. Um, so we showed these scenarios to individuals and conducted interviews with them. Um, so uh, we designed them based on what we have found in the literature and what we ourselves as uh, researchers found compelling features for these systems. Um, and we conducted uh, the, the uh, study in a way that participants first filled a personality questionnaire to rate their own personality. Then we had the interview, so we showed the um, the scenarios to the to the participants and discussed all the uh, possibilities. And then we asked them to fill out the personality questionnaire for the agent. So they basically filled out personality questionnaires twice: once for themselves, once for the agent. Uh, interestingly, we noticed that in terms of personality, they rated or higher or equally to all the five uh, subscales of the uh, TP personality questionnaire, which is the top five uh, questionnaire, uh, the top five personality, uh, sorry, big five personality questionnaire. Um, and uh, they, they rated significantly higher in terms of agreeableness, uh, conscientiousness, and emotional stability. So these characteristics constitute reliability of, of the system. So it's not super surprising that people expect the system to be reliable or more reliable than themselves. Um, and we also found uh, correlations in terms of agreeableness of the participants as well as the device. So the more agreeable the participants were, the, higher, the more agreeable they wanted the, the system to be or the agent to be. Uh, we also found uh, a co negative correlation in terms of participants' openness and systems' emotional stability. So if the higher the uh, openness of the participant, the lower the emotional stability of the device could be. Um, overall, we yielded like four categories of features that participants wanted for uh, assistants to have at homes. Uh, there were a lot of requests with regards to speech characteristics, what kind of gender it has, what kind of pitch it, it uses, uh, is it realistic, is it not realistic, does it have this accent, it should have this dialect or this accent, etc. So a lot of characteristics with regards to uh, the voice of the agent. Then there were uh, requests about the visualization, they wanted the system to be embodied, they wanted the, to see the agent, they wanted it, uh, they wanted to be able to uh, modify how it looked or how, how it moved. Um, then another aspect was the personality of the agent. So the, how funny is the, is the AI agent or uh, how, how moody is the AI agent? Does it, have, does it change the way it talks depending on context? Uh, and privacy and security, which is uh, uh, an important topic in, in voice user interfaces. So participants wanted to feel safe and secure, know what happens to their uh, voice data, unlike what uh, currently happens with many of the home assistants. Uh, so going back again to this design goals, there, there are a number of functional goals, uh, goals that uh, we attended to, uh, we made an attempt basically to uh, enhance it in some ways and a number of experiential goals that goals that we uh, we also aimed for them to address them somehow so i don't have time today to go through all the papers or all the research that we've done in this area but we worked on on uh, agents personality in terms of humor we worked on agents visualization how should they, they be embodied uh, we worked on speech characteristics uh, the demographics of the agent how many agents should there be? How many characters? How many uh, personas, so to say? 
Um, but one thing that we questioned, um, I, we discussed a bit earlier. So I mentioned that the process is user gives an app input, system processes it, then the system gives an output. But is this always the case? Uh, that was the question that we raised in one of our researches. Um, so what if the system starts and initiates something and then the user has to respond back to that? Uh, we were quite interested to see what people would feel about this and how people see proactive interventions by system. So currently all the systems are reactive or most of them that exist, at least for, for consumers, they're reactive. So they don't say anything until you say something and they react to your intent. So we wanted to look into the future of these devices that they could possibly become proactive. So they could start something before you initiate. Um, so in this study, uh, I, I, I will explain to you what, what I mean by um, proactive behavior. So proactive is basically considered as agent initiated interactions uh, triggered by events related to the user and their environment as opposed to user initiated inquiries or pre-configured uh, actions such as reminders, alerts, or routines set by the users. So what we did is uh, we wanted to understand how people perceive and feel about proactive interventions uh, in a home environment. So we designed an elicitation study to investigate the desirability of agent initiated interventions. And our research question was first, uh, on, under which circumstances is proactive interventions perceived desirable and how should they, they be initiated? So what is the process of the agent starting a conversation? So we, for this study, we also uh, use the scenario-based design uh, approach. So we designed a set of storyboards illustrating a range of possible proactive interventions in a home environment. This is one of the examples. So in this scenario, for instance, two people are having lunch. Uh, they are talking about uh, when they plan uh, to go to the cinema. One of the users is saying, we agreed to go at seven. The other one is said, we agreed to go at six. Then the device jumps in and says, if I may interrupt, uh, you, Marta is right. You decided yesterday to meet at this time. Um, so this is one of our uh, nine scenarios that we use for this study in order to elicit uh, further uh, contemplation. Um, so all scenarios were presented in uh, cartoon sketches with two panels. We didn't have any official expressions to avoid influencing participants in interpretation of, of the scenarios. We try to minimize the culture and ethnic cues in this in the characters. Uh, and we conducted interactive interviews uh, with 15 people using a virtual uh, whiteboard in Miro. And all the sessions were done remotely via video calls. Uh, so we first asked them, what are your first thoughts? What are your impressions on the scenarios? And then asked them to rate usefulness, appropriateness, invasiveness uh, of the scenarios. So they had to sort basically the scenarios in these uh, three scales. Then I speculate how each scenario may evolve. Uh, so the scenarios did not have an ending, so it didn't show what was the reaction of the users in the uh, in the scenario. So we asked participants that you imagine how it would end, so to say. And then we asked them to rewrite the scenarios that for them was invasive or inappropriate. So try to make it less invasive or try to make it more appropriate. And lastly, we asked them, how do you think the system should initiate the conversation? So we, uh, this is basically how the sorting task works. So this is a um, Miro board where you see all the scenarios with different color codes. You could, of course, zoom in to read the scenarios. Uh, participants would sort them from high to low in terms of here is the dimension of uh, usefulness. Uh, right. So. All the participants were proficient in English and the study took around 50 minutes. Um, overall, we had very diverse opinions on proactive behaviors. Some really liked it and thought it's providing helpful solutions. Uh, some said they would rather ask for help rather than getting help without asking. Uh, others said it's like a double-edged sword. 
it both helps and it can be intrusive. Um, one of our, so the most useful scenario, most appro appropriate and least invasive was this scenario where the agent intervenes in a case of fire in the apartment. So this was an emergency situation. Particip participants found this to be appropriate, useful, and non-invasive uh, for the agent to intervene. This was uh, the least useful and least appropriate scenario where the agent jumps in during a quiz and gives the answer to the uh, to the question. Uh, so we designed this uh, purposefully to also have uh, a malfunction in our scenarios uh, for for participants to be able to see like a broad uh, broad scenario. I would say. And the most invasive and highly appropriate inappropriate scenario is the one that we already looked at, uh, where two people are having a moment talking, discussing about something private, and the system jumps in. Although it's something factual, people do not like it. Um, so the perceived helpfulness of such uh, interactions, of proactive interventions, uh, whenever the agent could save time uh, or the agent understood a call for help indirectly. So sense that now it's needed for users to, uh, now the user needs support in this or in that, now I can provide it. In case of urgent situations or, or health risk, then it would be appropriate for, for the agent to intervene. Or important reminders. Um, so reminding users about something that uh, they might have forgot. Um, However, one, one of the most common patterns we noticed was the dilemma. We also briefly talked about it, uh, that it can be quite helpful, but at the same time intrusive. So whether the intervention overall is desirable or not, undecided. Um, so for several scenarios, participants were not sure about whether the intervention was overall a good intervention or, or a negative one, so to say. Privacy and mistrust was one of the biggest downsides of this. So for such systems to become proactive, they have to be constantly listening. They have to be context aware. They have to be able to know what's happening, who's in the room, uh, and what are the previous actions that happened. So uh, based on a lot of uh, lawsuits against the uh, systems such as Amazon Alexa or, or other voice interfaces, they don't have a good reputation. So uh, people do not really trust what happens with their data, do not know if it's shared with uh, different third parties and they, they fear the misuse of their personal data. Uh, another factor was that an extra entity intruding their private environment. So. Um, one of the participants mentioned, for instance, it's like another person is always in your home. I do not like that. Fair enough. Um, social context. So if it helps to resolve an issue and save time, it can be perceived as pos positive or desirable. Uh, but it's only appropriate where, when people first have a chance to resolve it themselves. So they want to have the control. They want to be able to try themselves first. If not, okay, now I need your help. Uh, if the intended person could not respond, the agent intervention was useful and appropriate. So if I ask someone in the room that could you do this for me and the person says no, maybe now is a good time for the system to respond back and say, okay, I can help you with that. Um, so it should not take away bonding opportunities from, from, uh, from the people. It should understand the relationship between people who are present and sense the intimacy of the conversation basically. and. Uh, in general, correcting people was something that was perceived pretty inappropriate and people did not like that. Um, people wanted, people were concerned with regards to their loss of agency. One, one participant mentioned, I'm a person and I decide for my life. A, I should not decide what I need. Uh, another mentioned, I feel like the system is forcing me to be productive and be useful a part, uh, be a useful part of society. It takes my mind to dark places. Uh, so this was with regards to one reminder that the uh, the system gave the participant to okay wake up it's time to go to work participant did not really 
uh, like that intervention. And uh, they basically wanted to have control over this intervention. They wanted to customize it, personalize it. What time does does the system is is the system allowed to be proactive? I can switch it off. I can switch it back on. Um, so autonomy. And in terms of initiating interventions, uh, ask for permission or give some kind of cue. So the system should be able should first. Uh, give the the uh, people some kind of a cue that hey there is something that I want to share, and if they approve that, then the system can initiate the interaction. So, based on the responses, we came up with this uh, initiation process model. So the system gives some kind of a cue. This cue can be visual, can be verbal, can be just a sound effect. Uh, if that is approved by the user, then it can announce the topic to the to the users, depending on the context. Maybe it's a topic that I do not want to share in this moment with these people being uh, in the room, but maybe appropriate when I'm alone. Uh, if that is approved, then the system can initiate. So takeaways. Um, the desirability of these interventions depended on significance. So how urgent the topic was, how important the topic was, uh, and the more appropriate the proactivity of, of the intervention was perceived. Uh, then social context and environment, who, who is present in the room? What's the relationship that the, these people have with, uh, with one another? And what type of ongoing activity do they have? Um, then agency and control. I have to be able to configure the features. I have to be able to control when it happens. I have to be able to stop it from listening. Um, individual user factors, of course. So personalized, uh, personalized factors here, considering uh, users' physical and cognitive abilities, current physical emotional state, uh, and and their personality and preferences. Um, and form of execution, which we discussed, like first initiate that you want to say something, then announce the topic, and then maybe you can talk about it. So in, in, in my research, I looked into a variety of, of these functional and experiential goals. And uh, what we mainly saw in, in uh, during, the, during uh, our, our experiments was that people want the systems to be solid. That they want it to be functionally perfect, accurate recognition, uh, very appropriate error handling method, which does which does what the user in which helps with the intention of the user, not what's best for the user. A large space of possibility and capabilities, and on the other side, adaptable to individuals. So subjective uh, subjectivity should be a factor. Personalization, customization, uh, high user agency and autonomy. So this system should allow for that. Con they should be context sensitive. They should be aware of what's happening in the environment, who are the people, what events uh, are going on. Uh, anthropomorphic, so they have to be embodied. They have to look like humans. They have to have realistic voices. And privacy and security. So they should be safe systems. Uh, so basically, People want the system to be pragmatically accurate, and they want it to be attractive, appropriate, and secure. And this was also uh, clear for us in another study we, we run about ca visual characteristics of the system. How should the system look like? And we found that participants want the system to be attractive, healthy, young adult, and it should have similar demographics in them. So if we consider all the uh, expectations that users have from these systems, we can imagine that a desirable speech agent would be some kind of a superhuman. Um, so to sum things up, a desired speech, a, a desired speech agent for uh, users is an agent which has anthropomorphic features, which is very secure. <coughs> does not share the data with third parties. You know what happens with the data. It's adaptable. You can customize it. You can personalize it. It's reliable. It functions well. It does what you want to do. And it's context sensitive. So it's aware of what's happening in the uh, in the environment. 
And that's basically all from my side.